very deep. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. So we are tasked with covering the overarching topic of how to make great television, which is a bit of a misnomer because it's really about making great content these days, not just television. And they all are intersecting. Um, so I thought we would go through a couple big topic areas uh, since it is a big topic to cover. But one is really, why is this being billed the golden age of television? Um, and how can you as content creators tap into that? And Susanna will give us her tips on how to really achieve that. Um, the other thing is, since I'm with Fast Company, I thought it'd be interesting to ask Susanna about the new technologies that are out there and this intersection between technology and content. What are the useful tools out there that could be of use to you all and which ones to maybe avoid? Um, and lastly, just we're going to end with Susanna's really great takeaways and tips that you all can benefit from in terms of making your content really stand out from the pack and resonate. So with that, I'm going to turn to Susanna. And I'd like to just start with, as I mentioned, this is being billed the golden age of television. Do you really agree with that? And how are you tapping into that in terms of, you know, the appetite has never been more for great content. So how are you making your content resonate and stand out? Well, thank you. First of all, I'd like to say it's wonderful to be here. Um, as you heard in the introduction, I work for Discovery Networks. Many of you will know it's a company that's 30 years old and has always been um, a survivor and, in fact, as a pioneer um, as a company. It's one of the first cable networks in the U.S. and one of the first channels that came over to Europe from the U.S. So, as you said, the, the title of the session is How to Make Good Television. And I, I do think now probably the question is how to make good content. Um, does it really matter where people view your content as long as they're viewing it and you're getting value for it? I think probably not. Um, I think we're finding now that because uh, it, is, you know, it is a golden age for content creators, there has never been a, a richer range of content being created. Consumers have never had more choice or become more demanding. And for broadcasters and for all of the content uh, creators, there has never been more opportunities to get your content seen uh, by more people right across the globe. The challenge is when people only probably have, and I, I guess most of you maybe, if you're lucky, have two or three leisure hours in your entire day, probably many of you are thinking an hour tops, is how on earth do you make sure that your content is one of those two or three hours that is chosen, or, your, or 10 minutes, wherever you're choosing to uh, share your content. So I want to share over the next 20 minutes how we approach making sure that our content cuts through. Uh, and that's partly about distribution, making sure that people can find your content easily, kind of one-click access. You, you know, very, very good content uh, needs to be risen to the top of the pile. Algorithms are very useful, but we have to make sure um, that program titles stand out. We very, have strong frontage with talent as well. Um, but also that the content itself has a reputation such that people want to talk about it and are prepared to share it. We're in a world of recommendation now. Social media is a, a benefit, uh, but also obviously a drawback if your content doesn't quite cut through. I think the days of printed listings, uh, command and control from broadcasters are over. Um, your content can have a very, very long life uh, through recommendation in social media. It can have a very, very short life in social media as well. Um, if your friends are all saying, don't bother, I've watched the first two episodes, episodes it's terrible. Um, you know, that is something that we're all going to have to live up to uh, as content creators and make sure that we raise our game. So how do you make your content not only be viewed, whether it's on social or other platforms, but make it stand out enough to sh that someone wants to share it and take that extra step? I think the, the filter I have for me or the question I ask myself is, would I, you know, do I think it's worthy of somebody's time? Um, and there's two ways of thinking about that. The question is whether you're going to win their head or their heart, or preferably both. And great television, in my view, or great content, at the essence of it, has a great moment. There's something, and if you all think about, um, just momentarily, what is the most memorable moment you ever remember seeing on television? Uh, it's actually worth just sitting you know, with friends and saying, what is the, the key moment of television that sticks in your memory? You've asked, of, you've asked a lot of people that. I have. What have you found their answers tend to be? Um, we've certainly, you know, it can be a great sporting moment for someone who's a passionate team fan. For me and, and some British people of my age group will remember the death of a comedian live on television, had a heart attack and died on stage. Um, obviously, the uh, tragic unfolding of 9-11 
uh, live on television was huge, but also it can be a very funny moment that you want to share with people. So um, I'm going to play a reel shortly that um, I hope shows how discovery is able to get it to the heart of a moment, the moment of the content. And I would ask all of you as content creators, as you bring a piece of content to bear, is there a moment in the center of that content that people will feel, remember, and even talk about? So you're going to see very, four very short moments uh, from a range of content from our networks. Um, and the first one, I'll just set it up for what you're going to see, uh, because I think it reflects very well on us as content creators as well, is the moment when you realize you're going to fail. Um, you're going to see Ed Stafford, who's one of our survival experts. It's very, very difficult for survival experts to admit defeat. And that's, that's a rare thing to see on television, and it's a very memorable moment uh, for a lot of our, our viewers. The second is for a bride from our show, uh, Curvy Brides Boutique, when she realizes really quite how fantastic she is, someone who's struggled with her own perception of herself. Uh, the third one um, is the true essence of the Olympic spirit and somebody realizing that you can succeed in many, many different ways in life. Uh, and the last one, which I think is the one uh, that certainly sticks with me, is the moment when you realize it's too late. So if we can play the video, please. I have got a safety team, but the further I go into the mountains, the, f the more distance I put between me and them. And the less chance there is of actual extraction, of safety, of being able to get out of a potentially dangerous situation. No part of me, no part of me wants to admit failure. I've been doing so well on this trip so far. And yet I don't know how it's possible to cross this entire mountain range if, if I can't stand on the snow, if I just sink into it. I had a little wave of self-pity just then. I hate admitting failure. I hate admitting failure, and it's humbling. It is extraordinarily humbling. But I don't think I can do this. I think I have to go back. I love my figure. I'm very confident in my skin. It took me a while, but I got there, and I love myself. Yeah, so this is your first ever wedding dress you've yeah. put on? Yeah. And how bizarre does that feel? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you look nice! Now that's a good reaction. That's so nice! Oh my god. I love it. I'm not wearing anything else. Look, look at you. I saw that girl on the mirror. And it wasn't Christine. Just the bride. Walking down the patrol and I activate a pressure pad ID with my left foot. And that was the last thing I remember. I woke up about eight days later from a coma in Birmingham. The Olympics, the Paralympics, inspired me to become a Paralympic powerlifter. I could say that the Olympics saved my life, but my favourite is the Winter Games. I mean, no one's going to die running 100 metres. But these guys on the snow and the ice, they risk their lives every single run. And the sport which always looked like the most dangerous and the fastest to me was always the skeleton. Your face scraping against the ice at 120 kilometres an hour. I never feel more alive than staring death in the face. Trust me, I know. But I want to prove that being an Olympian is not about having the perfect body or the perfect number of limbs. It's about the Olympic spirit. So I am going to become a skeleton athlete. And then I'm going to go up against the best there is, the reigning, able-bodied world champion. And I am going to try and beat him. So what's interesting, Susanna... Oh, okay. This is a song recording of a male oh oh singing on Hawaii. These birds mate for life, so he would be singing a duet with his mate, where he sings and then she sings back and forth. Here comes the male song. There's no response. 
That's the last male of a species singing for a female who will never come. He is totally alone. And now his voice is gone. Sorry, I jumped the gun there. But what's interesting, there's a pattern or trend throughout all the videos that they're highly raw and emotional. Um, and that's, I think, why a lot of social media content plays really well. So how, as a higher production um, entity, do you kind of still keep that authenticity and have it resonate in your content? I think that's such a good question. Um, I think authenticity is, is a word that we all hear a lot, um, but we should never step away from it. I think even then in, you know, in the comedy section we just heard just now, there's a lot of comedy in real life. And a lot of the most emotive things are real life. It's very hard to fictionalize that. Um, and so for us, it's looking for the right story, but capturing the moment and just building up to that and then serving it up to the audience and letting them react to it. So again, for me, the first time I saw that last piece of film, as we know that bird is now extinct, it makes you think, how do I feel about that? You know, there's enormous sadness, and then there's anger, and then there's what am I going to do? And that's when you can have a big social media um, conversation around a piece of content that is set out into the mainstream. It also obviously can be shared in a short. That's actually from a film that's 90 minutes long uh, that talks about the mass extinction that we're existing in right now, the sixth mass extinction. But you can get these things into shorts and get people mobilized. Uh, and I've been amazed, actually, how if you catch light with something, that social media would do the work for you. You can't decide that something's going to be viral. You can't decide that people are going to find something interesting, amusing, or, uh, you know, shareable. They will be the people who decide that. You know, your job is to find uh, the right moment, serve it up well, um, and make sure you hit home with something that's valid use of their time. So there seems like in the content space right now, there's very high end production, like what Discovery does. There is lower end, which is what like I do at Fast Company on the video side. Um, is there room for that middle ground of content if someone is not quite versed or equipped to do either ends of the spectrum? I think that's a really, really good question. Um, I think what we're seeing is, is sort of three types of content, if I can just step back. We're seeing big, mass, high-end, global content, and that's doing really, really well. We're also seeing sort of, if I can call it, global niche content, where you can see people who are massively into cars doing well or massively into certain sports doing well, massively into sports. You know, there are very, very big global niches that we can all dig into and serve well across multiple platforms and different types of media. And then there's super local. Your question really is, uh, I think the first one has to be premium, premium. Um, I think there's more forgiveness in the other two um, because there is a stronger relatability in the other two. Um, the question is, is the actual essence of the story good enough? But I do think consumers now do have very high expectations. They will forgive a lot, but what they won't forgive is a poor story and a waste of time. And then it seems a lot of this comes down to tapping into the right audience. Um, and when we had spoken, you had this great concept of serendipity and how that's being lost. So if you could explain what you meant. Yes, I, I am slightly, and I think this is something we've all got to be thoughtful about, which is how are people going to find the content we're all making in the future? Um, you know, if listings and electronic program guides are becoming less used over time, they're still hugely used, of course, but it's much more about recommendation or even voice activation. How can you be sure that when someone speaks into their, uh, their Alexa or whatever you like, they're going to ask for the kind of content you're making? You know, is it going to be talent-led? Is it going to be something that makes me happy, makes me laugh, shocks me, surprises me, talks to me about... Um, environmental issues, talks to me about inspiring content, says, you know, I'm tired, show me something, or I'm female and I want something like this. I think we've all got to start thinking about who are we serving. We're going to have to think about metadata. But I do have faith. I really, really feel very strongly that good content always bubbles to the top because people are out there all over the world seeking it, finding it, and they will move it up. I think algorithms can do so much. I think algorithms in some ways can kill serendipity, actually, because they assume that what you like is what you will always like. Um, but looking at all of us and how we share in the same way that Spotify allowed us all to share music tastes and playlists, 
I look forward to the time that we will increasingly share content with each other. You know, your friend likes this or try that, and we will do more of that. That means that content needs to be of a variety of lengths. You can't just have check out this hour and this hour and this hour and this half hour. We don't have enough time. You know, so I, I'm really excited about you know, Facebook Watch, 15-minute content. You know, we have to work with people's lives. The consumer now is fully in control. They have infinite choice, more content than they can ever consume in their life. It's like those 100 books you need to keep meaning you mean to read. Um, gosh, I mean, how are we ever going to watch all the content that everyone's told us about? It will bubble to the top. But you're, you know, the game has been raised. And production values are, are one element of that. But great storytelling, great you know, characters in the heart of it, and that great moment that everyone's talking about um, is going to be the thing that sees you through. And what about technology? There are all these new tools that are at everyone's disposal now, AR, VR, 360. Um, which ones are you using specifically for your content? Yeah, I mean, for us, I mean, technology is one of those things that I think it's very easy for us all to get very excited about. We all leap on. For me, it's, it's a very, very simple principle, which is does it enhance the storytelling? Um, you know, it has to have the story has to be first, consumer and story first. If the tech can help you tell that story better or take it to new people in new ways, fine. But it's never going to transform an average story. So for me, it's a real focus on, you know, who are you targeting? I'm amazed by the number of content creators who come and talk to us and you say, who's this for? Who are you targeting? Who will love this? And they haven't even thought about it. They've just come in with an idea. And yes, nobody wants to fetter creativity. We do want left field ideas. Of course we do. But there has to be some realism about, I could imagine that this sort of person will watch this content and this is how many of them there are. You know, so I think, again, more focus on the target audience, technology used sensibly in their interest to enhance the storytelling, not just for the sake of it. I think consumers, viewers, audiences, whatever you want to call them, they can see straight through that. Totally. Um, the other thing I was kind of interested in, and all your content would generally fall in the unscripted category. I feel like a lot of attention is paid to the scripted content that we're all, yeah, what, what show, what series are you watching now? So where is the space for unscripted content in the industry, and how can you know, it draw the kind of attention that scripted content draws? Okay, so again, take the lead from the consumer. Almost everything you see in social media, a huge amount that you see on YouTube is unscripted. You know, real life is stranger, funnier, madder, and more fun than fiction a lot of the time. Um, so for me, the unscripted world is enormous. Uh, it's going to grow, not get smaller. And actually, we all need variety in our viewing diet. You know, just having the meat of fiction, it's too rich. People need a little bit of real life. And again, we saw real life comedy there. And I think also, for me, often when I see even fictionalized storytelling, when I see the words based on a true story or this is a true story, that again gets my attention even more keenly because I think, wow, you know, this really, really happened and they've bothered to make a film out of it. So scripted fiction, but scripted also as a method for telling true stories are two separate things. So I think we need to bear that in mind in terms of uh, non-scripted content. So we're out of time, but is there one last takeaway that you just want to Yes, tell two takeaways. So filters I would apply if I was you. Is your content the biggest, best, first, or different version of whatever you're making? Is it the biggest? Is it the best? Is it the first? Or is it different? If it's smaller, the fourth version, the same, you know, and, and not very different, it's never, ever going to work. And I think if you're looking at the digital space, another useful filter is the FUBI filter. I don't know how many of you have heard of that. F-U-B-I. Is it funny? Is it useful? Is it beautiful? Or is it inspirational? Those are the four areas that are really, really igniting content in, in the social and digital space. So those are my two tips. Well, I loved speaking with you. It was lovely having you this conversation with you, Susanna. And hopefully you all gained something as well. Thank you all. Thank you very much.